For courses exploring the foundation of modern philosophy, as well as live events bringing philosophy to life, visit philosophyportal.online and become a member today. Throughout 2024, our members get access to four monthly events. In March, we focus on the concept of the sacred and welcome guests Andrew Davis, Ruth E. Kastner, and Matthew Segal. Find out more at philosophyportal.online. Welcome to the second Singularities podcast. The Singularities podcast is uh, really an experiment, and I'm figuring out what it is as I go. But I think what really centers the Singularities podcast is the personal story and the idea of a universality which needs to be understood through the singularity of someone's personal story, someone's personal history. And that this is actually a really important dimension of what we might call religious thinking or spiritual thinking or theological thinking, that when we approach topics of religion, when we approach topics of spirituality, I think it's really important that we avoid getting caught up in universal abstractions and really bring our attention to the singularity of the other person, the personal history of the other person, and the life vicissitudes that we all go through uh, in our own relationship to, we want to say something higher, something divine, something more powerful than ourselves. I think the personal story offers a beautiful window. And I'm really excited to have this conversation with Peter Robinson. Peter Robinson is someone who I met through teaching the Science of Logic course, and he has become an important part of our larger internet communities, whether it is presenting at the Science of Logic conference, where I learned a lot from him there, or whether it is on other podcast appearances he's made since then. Um, Peter is always a joy to think with, and I'm really looking forward to talking with you today, Peter. I think just starting off with this theme of singularities is, you know, where's your seed? Where did you start? And uh, yeah, what was it like for you growing up? Well, firstly, it's a great pleasure to be here. Cadell, it's always a pleasure to uh, engage with you and talk with you and learn from you. So, you know, thank you for this opportunity. Um, I was born in 74 into a into a nominally military family to parents in Northern Ireland. I was actually born in the UK because my father was stationed there at the time. I was born in South East England. And at six months age, um, I moved to Germany for three years when my father was stationed and then back to the UK for a year and then back to Northern Ireland where my parents and my whole family are from. And... Uh, uh, my, my dad's father uh, was a Protestant and my dad's mother was a Catholic, a great no-no uh, at the time in a little town east of Belfast and um, a very big family. My dad was eldest of 11. He had seven sisters and three brothers who all followed him into the army, the British army, I might add. Uh, so British, Irish, um, Presbyterian, Protestant family. By and large, my dad's mum's family sort of disowned her for quite a few years for marrying a Protestant. And um, I grew up there from about six until 11 years old, when I then moved to a very affluent and green part of southeast England, when my dad left the army after 16 years of service. And uh, it, they became publicans, my mum and dad. And so I was sort of raised in a relatively affluent area went to a great high school some very fond memories there from teachers whose whose names and characteristics in my mind um, learned a great deal from inspired me in so many ways um so yeah when i when i lived there i remember at one point i suppose i was about 10 years old um i'd spent quite a few years um voraciously eating science books and encyclopedias children's encyclopedias other encyclopedias anything i could possibly get my hands on by way of science 
and uh you know it started with a love of the, really with the question you know what does prehistoric mean you know like how can something be before history and that led me off on a quest to understand how long ago the dinosaurs were around and then the age of the earth and then into the um into the universe i spent many many years in my teens studying physics and um, astrophysics and then moving back into this sort of theme that i had around scale of deep time or even very fast time what happens on the scale of nanoseconds or billions of years and then deep space you know how large the cosmos is and that just became a world for me of uh, exploration reading and learning um often at the expense of other high school academic subjects um uh, because I suppose having been raised in the environment that I was, I came to understand many years later that the time my parents spent in Northern Ireland and the reason that my dad chose to leave the army was because he was becoming somewhat of a target and wanted to have his family safe. So I kind of grew up under the protection of the British military. Um, never myself, I have a brother who's three years older and at no point were we ever encouraged down a path of you know, discipline and, and uh, you know, military service or anything remotely like that. I had the complete freedom, especially when I came over to Southeast England to be whoever I wanted to be, to do whatever I wanted to do. I never rebelled as a teenager. I never um, gave my parents any real cause for concern. I didn't really drink alcohol because I grew up in a pub and coming home from school every day through the bar to get to the flat upstairs, seeing, you know, people drinking heavily often even in the middle of the day kind of put me off alcohol until a couple of decades later um so i was very lucky to have a great deal of freedom and um, to um explore the universe I'll put it that way and to learn as much as i could and then also i was somewhat of a geek at high school so you know me and the other nerds a small band of us would you know hovel in the science labs or the computer labs and kind of you know, stay away from the rest of the social milieu or perhaps also be excluded from it to a large degree. Um, so that was the kind of environment that I grew up in. And then I went to university. I did a degree in, um, started off as a degree in artificial intelligence, computer science, which I was sort of largely failing for a couple of years, after, for a couple of reasons after two years. Uh, one was just kind of being sick and tired of learning an awful lot of programming languages, um, but also uh, having fell in with a great friend and musician who we spent a, a lot of time uh, taking all kinds of drugs and psychedelic medicines and writing music all the time, much to the expense of my, my uh, grades. So after a couple of years, I, uh, uh, I'd been playing in a pool team with um, a lecturer from the head, in fact, of the philosophy department, uh, who invited me. He'd seen, heard through the grapevine in the students' union that I was a pretty good pool player, and invited me to come and play for the local team that he was the captain of. And uh, I remember having a great match with him the first game. We'll just try you out and see if you're any good. And then in this uh, eight pool, eight ball pool game, I managed to clear up on the break. <laughs> uh, in fact, he broke, and then I cleared up. And he said to me, "I think you'll do." So I kind of got to know David Smith quite well, and uh, he persuaded me to uh, switch over to the philosophy department, which apparently the philosophy department was very, very good at poaching students from other uh, schools within the university. Uh, so I completed a bachelor honours degree in, in philosophy, and in that I did a lot of uh, um, philosophical psychology and philosophy of mind, um, obviously a broad base there in both the analytical and the continental traditions. I didn't encounter Hegel at that time, strangely enough, but I did Nietzsche and Kierkegaard and Husserl and Brentano in that tradition. Um, but just before I'd started the degree, I had the, I don't know whether you'd call it good fortune or misfortune to stumble across a precocious little book by Daniel Dennett published in 91 called Consciousness Explained. And uh, that resonated with me extremely deeply i really think that there was a moment in there in his dialogue uh you know ostensibly like the dialogue between hylas and philonaus in in barclay's writings um 
but this dialogue between the, the, the philosopher and the and the layperson trying to explain to them how um you know consciousness is real it's just not what you think it is it's kind of like a real illusion uh, and something within that really struck home for me after having read a great deal of scientific literature and saw how this um framework for a theory certainly sat very comfortably within a materialist tradition and then i proceeded with the rest of the the degree encountering all sorts of other uh, philosophers and, and points of view and worldviews, which was absolutely fascinating for me, all the while, you know, um, smoking copious amounts of marijuana every day and uh, occasional acid trips and stepping outside the front door on occasion going, what if the sky isn't really blue, you know, <laughs> and uh, yeah. what if the snow isn't really white and all of these kind of crazy questions that call the most seemingly basic aspects of reality into question so that well, i, I also us, a, well that's it takes it it takes us it takes us pretty pretty far in your story and there there's already there is so much um amazing material to work with um but i want to i want to rewind i want to rewind a little bit because we can we can sort of pick up many threads of this story and and sort of maybe as it were dive deeper into some of the the earlier dimensions and and pull out maybe aspects that will also reframe some of the later aspects you you've already um elaborated on and i i want to start with just going right back to 1974 going right back to northern ireland and 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 the uk um mm -hmm. and specifically sort of highlighting this this distinction between the protestant and the catholic that there's a family tension here. There's a there's there's a, a sort of a a religious war here at play, and I'm not sure how many people here are aware of how deep this war is in Northern Ireland and in the UK between the Protestants and the Catholics. Um, it's it's quite severe. You know, I have a I have a friend actually um, in Belfast, and I remember the first time I went to Belfast, um, he took me around. Um, I won't tell names actually because it's actually quite sensitive. But um, he took me around the the parking lot where he uh, he worked as a as an officer, as a police officer, and he said every time I have to every time I go to my vehicle, I have to go and check underneath the car to make sure there's not a car bomb there, because mm -hmm. there's literally you know these tensions with um you know a uh, a protestant being a or sorry a catholic being a police officer in a in a protestant country uh and 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 to basically i mean we have sort of religious terrorist violence that goes on uh regularly and and you can sort of see this shape um the landscape and i guess my question to you is is growing up in this situation seeing this around uh, your family members and and I'm assuming your larger cultural milieu. Uh, did this impact you as a child? Uh, do you have any memories of this from from when you were a child? Absolutely. And uh, I wouldn't say at the time it seemed to me that there was any impact at all because I wasn't really aware from sort of six until ten and a bit living there. I wasn't really aware until many years where I sort of looked back on that, that time and, you know, having become the person I am now and looked at certain threads of my sort of personality and development that uh, I think are residuals from that time. Uh, I mean, one place where I lived was a housing estate. Um, and on that housing estate in the street that I lived, the, the little curbstones along the road, along the, along the, the place, the cul-de-sac, were painted red, white, blue, red, white, blue, red, white, blue, all up and down the, both sides of the street. But you go around the corner into another street, it'd be painted green, white, gold, green, white, gold, green, white, gold. That being the color of the Irish flag and red, white, and blue, the color of the colors of the British flag. And so there was this sort of territorial aspect to uh, even just the housing estates in the area where I lived. But also where I grew up in Eastern uh, Northern Ireland was in this particular town was a relatively safe area. It was somewhat of a no man's land, as in probably operatives, uh, whether 
uh, official or paramilitary um, agents, people um, that kind of both kind of coexisted there in a in relative peace. Um, I do remember once when I was about 10 asking one of my dad's uncles um, a little bit about the, you know, the history, because as I understood it from my own learning at the time, uh, you know, 300 years earlier, a British king had invaded the north of Ireland with, with his army and with my surname as well, Robinson, anything really that ends in Sen or Sen is really, you know, Scandinavian, probably of Viking descent. Um, but, you know, that king would have gathered up his army from Scots and North Englishmen come over then. And I thought had fought an Irish king, a uh, Catholic Irish king, and uh, defeated him at the Battle of the Boyne somewhere in the late 1700s. And it was only a couple of years ago at my brother's wedding in Ireland that his father-in-law told me, well, it wasn't an, an Irish king that the English king defeated. It was another English king who was ruling Ireland. <laughs> he just happened to be Catholic. So this whole dispute sort of started 300 years ago as a territorial dispute, effectively. Well, it wasn't really a dispute then. The king came in, took it over, and Ireland for hundreds of years has, you know, without laboring the point, has been more or less under British rule until the beginning of the 20th century. And then various sort of sectarian groups have popped up to want to reunite Ireland, whether through political means or violent means. Um, so I'd asked my uncle this question at the age of 10, you know, isn't this really just the Southern Irish, at least some of them, wanting their country back? And he said to me, never talk to me about that again. And so that was an interesting response from one of my family members. Um, and so I guess I had my own perspective on it then. Um, on another level, you know, I knew subsequently that you wouldn't want to walk down the street wearing a pair of um, army camos, for example, which might be just a, a common street fashion in California or let's say anywhere else that you might just chuck on a pair of camos. You wouldn't do that because you might be, you just don't know who's driving past at the time and might want to uh, put a bullet in your kneecap. Uh, but another aspect from a personal point of view, from a psychological point of view, was just this air of that I didn't really know at the time, but I think did have some lasting psychological effect. And I think perhaps does for people who, you know, are immersed in that culture, grow up in that culture. Of course, everyone around me is to some degree or another very, very careful about what they say and whether it's going to be overheard. Because if you're just having a quiet drink in the pub, you don't know whether the person sitting in the booths next to you might know someone who knows someone. And so the gossip on the grapevine is extremely contained. And a certain sense of, uh, if you could call it a healthy or unhealthy paranoia uh, around the sharing of information in social discourse and so on. And I think having grown up in that way kind of left me, without realising it at the time, probably did leave me with a certain heightened level of suspicion towards the other, if we could put it that way. That's um, fantastic. I mean, and I, 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 again, it's it's coming from... Coming from Canada, where I would say we have a certain secular, we have a certain secular culture, of course, informed by Christianity and, and British culture in, in the background, and I very much grew up in a British household myself. Coming to Ireland and, and seeing um, these dynamics especially along the southern northern border. My granddad and I were driving through southern Ireland and then we were making our way up to northern Ireland when I was first going to meet the friend I was telling you about in Belfast. And I remember my granddad telling me that when we were going to some pubs or when we were going to some um, bed and breakfasts uh, along the route. It's like, be careful what you say, because I was starting to ask those questions. I was starting to ask those questions about the political questions about Southern Ireland. Doesn't they want their country back or something like that? You know, just, you know, not maybe not exactly that, but asking questions along those directions. Mm -hmm. And he, my granddad would say, don't ask that question here, because I would be bringing it up with him and like wanting to, to dig deeper. He grew up in Dublin and I was sort of like wanting to understand this tension. He was like, 
talk you can talk to me about this in the car but when we get out there you can't talk about that and it, it it's quite it's quite remarkable i would imagine it, it it would be impossible to to grow up in that environment whether you identify politically or religiously in whatever way without being deeply affected by that dynamic in in some sense and so my my question there would be um when you moved to england was this move in some sense to protect you from uh this type of uh this type of dynamic sort of uh leaving a longer scar on you or um, is there sort of a deeper motive there? I, I think it was primarily, if not entirely, uh, a more visceral threat to uh, my, my my father and the family um, of being found out or outed in his in his role, um, and then the whole family becoming a target. You talk about the your friend have, it was the police officer having to. You know, use a mirror under the car to check for car bombs. Well, it wasn't until many years later I learned from my mum that that was uh, something that she'd have to do just to go to the supermarket. Um, and you know, she regales a couple of stories there of uh, rather horrific or uh, potentially um, horrible events that could have happened. Um, I won't go into the details, uh, but didn't. And um, I think it was really for that reason more than anything that my father chose to take our family to, and, and with my mum, they discussed that at length to see what they were going to do. Um, uh, so yeah, it was really more about that, I suppose, more sort of our, our, our being alive rather than worrying about any long-term psychological effects. It's it's interesting the way in which theology and religious issues become irreducibly entangled with political um and and secular issues and and i i feel like this is an important thing to talk about because again i think in the west and 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 maybe i was hyper sheltered in a type of secular household but you know you you don't really realize how deeply these things are in, in entangled and i feel like we we might be encountering uh sort of a of course with 9/11 we had the the sort of brutal reminder of of this relationship between theology and politics and you know uh, we don't maybe we will go down this rabbit hole later in the conversation but the degree to which 9/11 shaped for example the new atheist movement i think should not be understated in regards to how much of a reaction the new atheist movement was to 9/11 as a sort of political theological event you know mm -hmm. which which i think shocked our consciousness uh, to the to the core in some in some way just in terms of you know how powerful that was and and how potentially dangerous that would be to future global politics you know but in it's any case oh, yeah. yeah go ahead well i was going i was i was going to i was going to sort of go from that direction to sort of say you know when you moved out of that context of Northern Ireland um, and your parents could sort of raise you in, in, in England. Um, did Protestantism and Catholicism um, play any role in the way your parents identified or raised you as children, or were they more um, just letting you make up your own mind and, and sort of giving you free reign, so to speak, in terms of um, belief and um, your, relationship to something bigger or something beyond yourself well neither of my parents were overtly religious people you know they didn't attend church they had a you know if they had a, a, a faith i couldn't honestly tell you my dad died over 20 years ago now and don't know i've ever really asked him that question or if i have i i don't remember but it was certainly a, a question worth asking because it wasn't obvious whether he had a, a faith in god um I think my my mum did, probably still does. Uh, I think my father's passing, uh, she she sort of <laughs> laments that she's fallen out with God since my father passed. Um, but neither of them were overtly religious people, and it never came into my household in any overt way. Uh, from a very young age in, in Northern Ireland, I went to, I remember going to Sunday school, I remember thinking at one point or being told at one point that this was the house of God that I was in, in a, in a sort of kiddie Sunday school, uh, and, and looking up at this beautiful, tall church building, wondering, like, well, this is God's house. It's like, 
where is he? I mean, I can't see him. Uh, at some point, the Sunday school teacher came to my mum and said, ah, Jean, I, I'm not sure that Pete's going to be a good fit for, a, for the Sunday school. And really from that age, I've never really uh, had any relating with the divine creator of the universe other than conceptually, perhaps. And um, uh, coming over to England again, uh, it's it was it was it's hard to say even more of a non-issue, but just certainly not an issue as well. <laughs> um, so I really had complete free reign. I was I was too busy trying to understand Einstein from quite a young age, uh, trying to wrap my head around you know special relativity for quite a long time, asking myself all sorts of questions about it, reading some of his work on it. Uh, he'd written for a lay audience again and again and again, a particular book back to back many times in a row until I really kind of got what he was saying and then general relativity and so on. So I was really much more interested in these grander themes and any question of God for me was um, just something I wasn't really interested in and had never really been put on my plate in any way. Um, so, yeah, I was uh, I really had just free reign in a secular affluent southeast England to just you know, do whatever I wanted, really, and almost exclusively music and study. It's super interesting. And and it, what, it, what it brings me to is there's a few things running through my mind. One is, are there, are there people with different psychological dispositions from childhood um, that, that, that lead them towards um, uh, a, a deeper religious connection or a deeper scientific connection and and why is that um and again another thing that's running through my mind is is it best to raise children in a way that they have a, a certain openness to the phenomena and the content that they study or naturally drawn to or is it best to sort of have a sort of more guided self-organization where you sort of expose them to certain religious texts or you expose them to certain religious books and sort of, you know, um, I don't know, teach them about original sin, for example, or, you know, or, 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 or encourage prayer, for example, is, you know, like, for me, I've always had the disposition and I don't have children, but this is also sort of how I was raised is that children sh should just be left to explore the world on their own terms. And if their parents have a religious belief, it's best um, embodied and not proselytized. You know, at, like if the parents have a religious belief, act it out, but don't, don't be forcing a certain doctrinal perspective on a child, that seems to me to be incredibly violent um, and and perhaps inappropriate for the spirit. And, and this is not a, <clears throat> I'm not even saying this with a, with an atheist or a, I'm not even saying this with an atheist or a non-religious bent, more saying it like, let the child have a certain openness and sort of come to questions of ultimate divinity or come to questions of ultimate being um, in their own process, um, so to speak. And I guess my, my question here is, when you look back from your current perspective on the way your parents raised you and the way they acted out their faith or the way in which they concealed belief or opened a certain environment that was open to you finding out what you really wanted to be and what you really wanted to think. What are your thoughts? Well, I largely agree with you. I mean, my I don't have kids of my own either. My, with my previous partner, I, I raised her, co-raised her son from eight to 18. Um, but so I kind of feel like perhaps I'm not really qualified to answer the question in a certain regard, but I suppose I've got some perspectives on that, which have certainly changed a lot over time, I have to say. I mean, I 
I drank the new atheist Kool-Aid quite extensively at the time on the one hand because it sort of resonated with the the the, the worldview that I had at the time which I would say has also evolved matured evolved changed grown transmogrified in many regards so again it sort of depends what age of me uh, is answering this question but on the whole um I like a lot of what Jordan Peterson has to say on this matter around, you know, whether my parents were overtly religious or not, that I was raised in a Presbyterian Protestant family, although, as I say, my grandmother, who was somewhat matriarchal, uh, was Catholic. Um, but let's just say in a religious tradition, or at least that's not really right either, but in a, in, in a, in a culture that was, you know, Christendom. Uh, late 20th century Christendom, if you like. And so that's going to have a vast number of values and ethos and prescriptions and prohibitions around how to be, uh, what matters, what doesn't, um, all these values that have kind of come out of that culture. And whether there's anything sort of explicitly stated in the form of, um, you know, doctrine, practices, church attendance, ceremony, those things were largely not there, which I think is quite common over the Western world. I mean, as a, the number of people who actually participate in a regular ceremonial activity with their fellow community members um, is relatively low. And I think that's one thing that the, the, the churches broadly offer. Um, it's more common in other religious traditions in many respects than it is in the secular West. Uh, and certainly even, you know, the number of Catholics that attend church, I am guessing here, but I would say it's probably slightly higher than the number of Protestants that attend church, uh, perhaps from the very nature of the difference between Catholicism and Protestantism as well, perhaps. So like the, it's, it's just not, a, it, it's almost like the way that you ask the question it's sort of inevitable that you're going to instill the values that you have into your children to to some degree. And to what degree, you know, I think we can perhaps go too far in the West to try and avoid any kind of, let's call it value indoctrination. Uh, because well, if those values are in a certain sense religious construed in the in a secular way, in, a, in the broadest way, religious in terms of what binds us together as as a community, as people, as as, um, as community. Um, and so I guess I've had to really just step back a lot and reconsider a great deal of my thoughts around this. Now, where I mentioned Jordan Peterson, so he sort of certainly helped raise my awareness around a lot of that. Um, but I think also ultimately that religious um, formulations of how to live and relate, ultimately are borrowing them from the deeper evolutionary story of our origins as a species and beyond even uh, uh, us being homo sapien, um, a great deal of our social conditioning, I think, predates our species, to be perfectly honest. I think to the degree that that gets formalized into religions, uh, they're getting it from well from god <laughs> and well, what's that and i might have argued in the past that that's you know that's this uh, imaginary friend for adults but now i'm sort of more inclined to think that the great thrust of of existence and the necessity of survival uh is in large part what what god is or god is that or whether you want to use that word or not there's something deeper and wider than any of us can really truly grok and so we have to rely on our um family and our loved ones and our community for guidance for values for direction and whether that's in a sort of formal religious framework or not it's all there it's all available i would you know at least well, I guess it, it is. Uh, perhaps it's a lot easier to access if you're growing up in a religious tradition, um, but accessible nonetheless, especially in the free West, you know.
pick and choose what feels right for you, what resonates with you. Perhaps you want to be a Buddhist and participate in that community or do it alone in some sense, you know, find your own path. And as far as children are concerned, like I say, I kind of largely agree with you that the more freedom that you can give them to find their own way, but uh, it, it might be worth saying that there's there's a way to be found. Not for me to say, but finding your way, your way is, um, is uh, a great deal more valuable and likely to lead to a flourishing life than not bothering to find a way or your way for yourself. Um, I suppose in some regards, back to myself in my teenage years with my parents, busily running pubs for, uh, running a pub for, for, for five or six years during my teenage years, they pretty much left my brother and I out to my own, to our own devices. And, and perhaps I would have benefited a great deal from more direction, more, um, I don't want to say encouragement because my parents were very, very encouraging of whatever I wanted to do, but to the degree that uh, my parents and my father, especially who maybe had a great deal of wisdom to impart, didn't really have the time to do so. Um, so whatever that is, uh, I think it's very, very important that we can uh, at least offer it to our kids and let them absolutely make their own choices without thinking that we know better. And you're right, I think also that all you can really do, I don't really want to say should do, but all you can really do is 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 be an example or fail to be an example. Uh, the rest is dangerous territory, in my opinion. Yeah, I like that distinction. I think that's the distinction I was trying to highlight, which is, um, you know, the more the emphasis on on being there um and and sort of modeling by behavior um to your children well you i think you can't escape it like whatever you as a parent whatever you do in your behavior is going to be modeling to your children a set of values and directions which are implicit even if they're not explicitly said and i think that you know the the real sort of mess is um, when parents, I think, you know, emphasize, um, well, one, if there's a gap between their behavior and their speech, that children are going to focus on the behavior rather than the speech. Um, and, and two, whether the parents are using a certain metaphysics, which maybe they haven't thought about, or maybe they're not too, you know, deeply enriched in, in that, in that spiritual sense, imparting that onto children and just confusing them, you know, with with sort of metaphysical speculations, which a six year old or a seven year old really has no capacity to to work with in 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 a way that they might when they stumble upon either the Bible or the Quran or 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 another sacred religious text in their thirties or their forties upon their own sort of motivation upon their own sort of inclination. Um, but to your point, I think it's interesting that you brought up Jordan Peterson, because I think that why is Jordan Peterson so popular? Why Jordan Peterson became an intellectual phenomenon and a cultural phenomenon as quickly as he did and as powerfully as he did and in a sustained manner in the way he has, I think has a lot to do with the fact that he's well scientifically trained. He's not only well scientifically trained, but he's well scientifically trained in evolution. He's well scientifically trained in evolution that's connected to psychology. And he's opened up a perspective on the the, the atheist and the secular and the and 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 the the, the new atheist phenomenon in a way that I think exploded the dialogue. Um, exploded the discourse. And perhaps that's most symptomatic in sort of the discourse that he's continued on with um, Sam Harris. Mm -hmm. And in fact, if you follow that discourse along from the beginning of that discourse to where it is today, which they recently had a conversation just a few weeks ago, kind kind of starts to look like 
you know, the new atheist really does have a lack, really does have a a sort of um there's something deeply off with the way in which they're thinking religion and spirituality. And and probably a lot of that has to do with, I think, you know, the thing I was starting to think back when I was starting my doctorate is, well, actually the new atheist is kind of a postmodern deconstructive philosophy and actually is more a symptom of postmodernity than anything else. And actually is kind of paradoxically and interesting on a contradictory level, um, not evolutionary, because in some sense they don't sort of see the evolutionary value and the evolutionary utility of religion or care to look at it with an evolutionary perspective. Like, isn't it like from an evolutionary perspective, wouldn't it be strange if if religions were just illusory with no survival value whatsoever. You know, like it, it would actually make far more sense that that religions have a, a, an evolutionary survival value. And, and even I think that's what you were pointing at when you said, you know, isn't, you know, should we imagine God as, well, even if we imagine God as an, as, as an imaginary friend for adults, it could be that having an imaginary friend as you're an adult could also have a, a survival value. And I think the weird connection there is, is, you know, and this may be getting a little far ahead of ourselves, but, you know, you're interested in Daniel Dennett with Consciousness Explained saying consciousness is real, but it's kind of like a, a real illusion. Is that already that, in, and I always was more more sympathetic with Daniel Dennett than than the other new atheists, perhaps because he's like a actually philosopher. Is that, that you know, like Daniel Dennett with the idea that consciousness is a let's say a real illusion, is that that perspective shift on illusion, that perspective shift on fantasy seems to me dis to disrupt the sort of dismissive idea that um well god's just an imaginary friend because because even even freud would say things like that you know like freud would say like you know god is god is clearly an imaginary sky daddy you know that sort of narrative type of thing mm -hmm. you know and 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 he wrote that book future of an illusion mm -hmm. you know where he does open up a different perspective on you know he's talking about what is the future of illusion basically what is the future of 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 this of of religion in this context you know and and starts to, it starts to get into some really interesting and i think deep metaphysical ideas about what is real and what is imaginary and i think that this is going to become a mega issue in the 21st century because like just today just today i was watching um, Ben Shapiro, you know, Ben Shapiro, I was watching Ben Shapiro. He was, he was trying out the new Apple, um, virtual reality headset. Mm -hmm. And, and he was like fully in this virtual reality environment. And then he was talking afterwards and it was very, like, he was like, this is fully immersive. This totally shatters our reality and, and, and it could totally shatter our rela personal relationships and, and everything that, and, and he was saying like, you know, he's basically going through the logic of the singularity, right? Like if this stuff gets smaller and if this is connected to Neuralink and this is put into our brains, then our whole relationship between virtual and reality is shattered, right? So, so the point here I'm trying to get to is this distinction between the imaginary and the real and the relationship between the imaginary and the real getting so confused and you know, I, I guess I would bring that back to a question for you of when you're thinking about religion today, when you're thinking about the way you were raised and, you know, this this relationship between between religion and science and 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 reality and an illusion, um how are you thinking about some of these distinctions? How are you thinking about this and perhaps in a different way than, than when you were a child? Wow, there's so much to 
unpack around all of that. There's pretty meaty stuff in there. Um, starting with the Ben Shapiro thing, I haven't seen that particularly clip, but the first, what came to my mind, he's sort of describing, you know, when this stuff gets, you know, shrunk down even more and you get it put in your head and you've kind of got this virtual reality taking place and you're not going to be able to know the difference between reality and the virtual. Well, in some sense, that's exactly what being an animal is. You're already one distance removed from some greater reality. Your whole existence and the existence of all of your ancestors all the way back to the dawn of life are essentially these adaptive systems that are a response to an environment, changing environments over time, responses to something external, something beyond the animal. And, and so in that regard, it's like you <laughs> look around and... You've got a beautiful room there. You've got the red curtains. You've got the white walls. It's just that's reality, right? It's just the room you're in, right? You just, we don't even think about the fact that we're already in a virtual reality, the one well, that is. Let, this is this is kind of meta because this <laughs> is a virtual reality. <laughs> yeah. I realize that as you pointed out. Um, well, mine is not a virtual reality, but the one that I'm referencing is the one that I see, and that's a virtual reality, right? Because. It's composed out of my sense perceptions and my implicit assumption that that's what reality is. Uh, you know, if humans evolved in somewhere in East Africa a few hundred thousand years ago, along with all of our other primate ancestors, um, you know, I kind of think sometimes, what is the ultimate virtual reality? Well, it is the one in which our fingers and toes and arms and legs and you know, bipedalism and you know, our minds have evolved, adapted to an environment which is not really the city. It's not really even the the tamed um, countryside. It was, you know, the savannas and the rainforests of East Africa 300,000 years ago. That's the environment that our physical form is maximally adapted to because it was the one it was evolved in. So in, regard, in a certain regard, that's like the ultimate virtual reality. Um, so I... <laughs> That was just that point. Um, what else to say about that? I kind of lost my train of thought what you were talking about. That's okay. Before. I mean, I, I think that it's 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 already an interesting perspective shift because when we think about evolution and we think about our original environment being sort of the plains of Africa, you know, we, we think about that as the ultimate physical reality. Mm -hmm. We do. You know, that's that's I mean, that's sort of the, the the foundation. But, you know, you're saying it's actually the ultimate virtual reality. Um, and. Well, let's say, I, for, yeah. you know, living in cities now, uh, spending a great deal of time on the Internet. You know, I tend to regard these things which we call virtual realities as real it, 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 in, in whatever the, the class of real is that the real world is. That is the virtual world as well. I don't dis dis I don't really think that there's a a meaningful distinction there because all on earth virtual re all virtual realities are essentially on earth realities as well. How we think about them as virtual, uh, I think is it's valid, but it's not. It's, a, it's sort of a difference that doesn't really make any difference. There's a great book by Thomas Metzinger, The Ego Tunnel, where he sort of talks about two levels of abstraction from reality that characterize human existence. One is the, the, the sensory filter. That's the first tunnel you're in. Uh, the tunnel being, say, a separation from whatever it is out that the, 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 the senses are reporting on. And the second one is the self, that that really is also a construct, um, not, not real in the same class of real, in my, with different levels of real that we need to consider. Um, but there's sort of a double removal from reality, uh, uh, let's call it empirical reality, whatever that is, um, uh, the reality as, uh, as, as, as uh, detected through measurement apparatus, Whatever that is, there's something even more real beyond that. I think Lacan gets at that. that there's the, something more real, and even I think in Husserl, there's the irreal. And nonetheless, um, you know, so these virtual realities are okay. So I've sort of said enough about that. I wanted to move on to another point, which was, um, you know, the, the the lessons of science 
and the lessons of religion um i think in a way we kind of we ignore both at our peril i think um certainly uh you know someone who's a great has been a great advocate of the scientific approach and scientific method in its purest form which is uh idealized and the reality of scientific investigation appears to have been colored by the experimenter of the centuries um colored by the funding colored by perhaps the worldview what gets investigated or whatnot there's a thousand ways in which you could criticize the, the purity of the scientific enterprise just in the same way that uh, the new atheist types and let's say the anti-religious types um, criticize um, aspects of religious worldviews um, as being non-empirical, um, but to the degree that a great deal of empirical evidence, uh, I think there's a book by Ben Aker, Ben Goldacre in the UK, who's a doctor um, called Bad Science, points out that something like 80% of published scientific research is not actually peer-reviewed or i shouldn't say not peer-reviewed is not repeated so the degree that there's a scientific consensus that one person's gone and conducted an experiment if you go and conduct the experiment in the same way then in an ideal sense if that is validated by some independent experimenter then we've got a consensus or if it's disconfirmed then perhaps you know now we need a third experiment or a fourth one to see which of those two uh contradictory uh results might be valid and then let's go with the consensus uh but it turns out that something like 70 to 80 percent of all published scientific research is not actually repeated beyond the the first experiment so to what degree do we call that part of the scientific consensus so there's glaring holes in the entire scientific enterprise nonetheless there's a there's sufficient robust repeated empirical validation of um scientific theories obviously some of the big ones uh that um, broadly satisfy the um the conditions of human existence uh in material sense uh gravity evolution uh, and an, an awful lot more esoteric things but even quantum physics which is perhaps the most esoteric of all uh, has incredible practical utility in everyday life uh not necessarily not so much for me as an individual to know about it but i'm certainly using technology that would not work if it were not for the validity of quantum physics at the same time in the religious arena um you know dan dennett talks a little about about this that you know how do we actually identify what is um the good science of religion versus the bad science of religion and i don't mean that in a scientific sense i mean in a religious sense like what is worth preserving what what might even be commonalities and universalities across religions aspects that we're picking out about how to live a flourishing life how to relate well with one another how to have a an alignment with yourself with your family with your community with the planet even you know um, I know that there's this theme from some in the Islamic community that characterize the West as decadent, Western decadence and, uh, and, and rampant individualism. And perhaps 30, 40, 50, 60 years ago, that might have seemed a bit preposterous in some way because individuality and the sovereignty of the individual and, 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 and freedom, broadly speaking, uh, were these sort of undeniable, inalienable rights that we value at the at, at the core of, of of Western values, and but at the same time, we're now recognizing that we're living on a world that is finite, finite resources, and the question of what are the limits, if any, of our individual freedoms is becoming a very painful question in the West. Um, and certainly you mentioned about what kind of world we're heading into and in a way just to make a final point i've ironically i think 
always viewed my scientific understanding of the world uh, that I carried with me more or less uncorrupted, shall we say, for best part of 30 years. Sort of a different story these days. Um, but I always thought to myself and used to say to people, this is how the world is. <laughs> But whatever you do, don't try and derive your value system from it. I mean, as far as it looks, we're living in a completely a universe that's completely indifferent to our existence on a planet that is largely uninhabitable to our kind and certainly has been in earlier points in, in the evolution or the history of this planet. And anywhere else in the solar system is completely off limits to humans, more or less. Um, so, you know, some some god-given creation that is when the vast majority of it appears to be completely uninhabitable and indeed inhospitable to human life um so it's like for us to you know to come from from a um a secular tradition a secular community a secular nation um and to have embraced a worldview that by my own admission, doesn't offer any value system to take to heart, if I could put it that way. Uh, and then, well, I'll, I'll pause here, but then in certain life experiences and certain times of my life and certain relational issues, whether it's with a partner, whether it's with a community of, of people that I live in, of, of going, well, what is my value system? And having to kind of backtrack to identify where my values come from um if you could say my parents you could say my community you could say the place that i grew up in but where did that come from and if it's not from science broadly speaking in the in the, in the sort of um, empirical evidence uh the set of empirical evidence and the theories around it where are we going to to get that from as as people who are ostensibly secular and perhaps even non-theist um there has to i think be a full circle of recognition of values and perhaps that full circle uh, a good a good place to start i think probably is a, 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 a deep diving with with a few religions in terms of their their values and the narratives that they have and the archetypes that they have um i think there's just another open question there uh, hopefully an enjoyable one if people will engage with it on where those values come from because I don't think that they begin in religions I think they predate religions as well which brings us back to a scientific story uh, perhaps but then um, we're almost getting into the realm of speculative fiction by the time you get back to what life was like for a hominid a hundred thousand years ago Right. And I mean, I, I think you 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 took me where I wanted to go already because, it, you know, you said, you know, where is my value system? Well, it probably comes from my parents, comes from my community. Where did that come from? What I was thinking of is the 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 the, the, the value substructure of Judeo-Christianity, you know, like that's Judeo-Christian tradition. Right. And various denominations, various schisms that occurred throughout Western history. But then you can ask the question, well, where did that come from? And well, then you get into evolution. You get into the evolution of the human species, you get into the evolution of life and 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 so forth. And, and in some sense, you know, they that predates religion. But at this that predates religion at the same time, I don't think that invalidates the religious narratives and archetypes. I think it rather can be built in with. The religious narratives and archetypes that the religious narratives and archetypes that survived survived because they worked survived because they were pointing at something true survived because they worked for the mediation of humanity uh in history and in 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 a, in a way that evolutionarily perhaps outcompeted worse stories um and outcompeted worse archetypes Right. Like, um, you know, like when I think about, like, you know, so like when I think about like the archetype of Jesus or if I think about the archetype of Buddha or if I think about the archetype of uh, other religious figures, you know, I don't think those figures are random. 
right? I don't think those are, are, are I don't think those symbols repeat just, I don't think those just repeat because they're useless fiction. They must repeat because there's a, 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 a not only a utility, but an insight um, that, that humans in the past derived from those specific symbols. And I, I can't help but reflect on, on my spiritual path, the way in which the archetype of the Buddha or the archetype of a Christ have helped me in a certain way. Now, I do think that they helped me in a certain way that perhaps the secular religion, if we're going to say the secular, what is the secular religion? The secular religion do does seem to be something about individual rights because secularity does open up the space for any possible belief. Secularity does open up the space for any possible opinion, which is why certain religious denominations find secularity to be grotesque um, and, and, ab and an abomination, right? And we reach really key culture war issues here where, you know, I, I think we should explode them and bring them to the surface, you know? It, it, and this actually is quite powerful in France, actually, because there's, you know, France is an incredibly secular country. And at the same time is dealing with mass migration and mass cultural influence from Islam. And this really comes to the surface in the conflict between secularity and Islam. And one of the major debates that I see in the larger liminal web community is basically this distinction between people coming from a secular tradition fundamentally or recoiling from a bad Christian upbringing and saying we should try to work towards a religion that is not a religion right and that would be the direction of i think what you were pointing towards in some sense which is let's respect different religious denominations let's explore and do deep dives in different denominations and sort of pull from them the narratives and the archetypes that might work for us even on an individual level or on a familial level. Or, and I think that's how it should work. I think it should work first on the individual level and then with your intimate household, your partner, does it work for my family, nuke, like the, the base family or maybe my extended family, and then out from there. But it, it can very quickly become a nightmare if you just go from your individual insight straight to the major community. Because you can quickly go from the individual insight to this community abstraction, which very quickly becomes what Hegel would call an external cognition. And then you just project the external cognition on everyone, right? And I think this is the real mistake that we want to avoid. But th So you go from the religion that is not a religion approach versus what I see as much more attractive and much easier is people aligning with a specific denominational religion which already has a pre-established community set up and is just has an external cognition that you can, as it were, plug into. <laughs> you know, and I see this tension as, as incredibly difficult because going the path of the religion that is not a religion, basically, basically what that means is that you're building a tradition from scratch. And, and you're sort of using a sort of spirit science, I would call it a spirit science inquiry, into what works for me and the closest people to me and what doesn't and how can I continue navigating the cracks and the bumps of the social life without being tempted towards a reified external cognition on other people versus this religious story seems interesting, this archetype seems to work, let's just plug in here to this specific denominational religion. And then the question is, when you plug into that specific denominational religion, does that specific denominational religion play well with others? Meaning, does that specific denominational religion, can it fundamentally be compatible with a secular society? Meaning a society that accepts individual rights and individual beliefs and individual opinions? Or... Is it a denominational religion which says we are the true denominational religion and all the other denominational? Not only are the seculars grotesque, but the other denominational religions are grotesque as well. <laughs> like that always shocks me. You know, mm -hmm. like when I watch some of these battles between different denominational religions, 
a lot of the times they they do like say secular people are going to hell or whatever but what really blows my mind is when they they stop focusing on eventually they stop focusing on the secular people and they start fighting with each other and they, they then they're like, oh no the protestant and then that brings us back to the protestant catholic thing and and you know that sort of tension that we we started off with in your childhood but I do want to go deeper into your personal story, but I'd love to see sort of what thoughts are exploding out of you on this point. For courses exploring the foundation of modern philosophy, as well as live events bringing philosophy to life, visit philosophyportal.online and become a member today. Throughout 2024, our members get access to four monthly events. In March, we focus on the concept of the sacred and welcome guests Andrew Davis, Ruth E. Kastner, and Matthew Seagal. Find out more at philosophyportal.online. I really wish I would be taking notes along the way here, but uh, it's like I'm just giving you my full attention. Um, so many things came up for me around what you were sharing. Um, one is just the way that there's this notion of ideological capture, in a way that these 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 uh, large religions are, uh, uh, you know, whole you know whole community. Uh, a whole set of, um, you know, off-the-shelf beliefs, as it were. You just need to buy the package, uh, buy into the package, and you get a whole lot of benefits that come with that. Uh, there are um, certain cons with that, as it were, um, but there might be cons that don't really play out um, unless you run into some interpersonal problem with a family member or someone of a different denomination or, you know, who ends up being your elected leader or something else along those lines, who, who um, who's pulling your purse strings, then it might really matter what the pros and cons are. Until then, it's like pick your denomination and um, get all the benefits off the shelf. As to something like um, secular religion, the religion that's not a religion is kind of like freelancing, you know, it's a freelance religion. And you know, there's a vast number of... Uh, freelance religionists out there we could put it that way but there's not so much of a community amongst them so there's a there's a massive con in that regard uh a negative which i mean a negative um but you're also perhaps you might argue a lot more flexible and compatible with people who have um bought the package as it were um so that you know there's another sense in which if we could and would all agree to uh, overarching pol political principle of secularism across all religions, and that seems to be what's, if anything, one of the defining things about the secular West, it's like, well, have at it with your religion or lack of religion. Go whichever way you want. But when it comes to the um, authority of the state, that will remain secular but i suspect that what might be going on underneath is this kind of like uh unconscious capture the flag game where everyone can continue to be christian if they want they can become a christian if they want they can teach their kids to be christian if they want likewise for islam likewise for judaism likewise for other religions and emerging religions but perhaps at the back of all of that is is a notion that maybe one day, not even at the back of all of that, sometimes written down in the holy book, but setting that aside, at the back of all of that, there's this notion that perhaps one day your team will have the political authority. And I think when that happens, it's hard to imagine that um, under such circumstances that secular the secular principle will withstand or survive in the long term against the the longevity the the power uh, the compelling narratives of established ancient religions i wonder if that's really likely to be the case so you might ask what what are the what restrictions might there be on your freedom religious freedoms 
And that, of course, in terms of the United States Constitution, is sort of enshrined into the Constitution, the separation of church and state. And of course, it goes both ways. But it's not it's not a, it's not impossible to imagine the United States falling into some form of authoritarianism. Uh, and, you know, that seems to be somewhat of a, a comfortable bedfellow for um, certain religious traditions, at least in certain quarters, in terms of sort of theocracy. Um, and the idea that these things can't, that, that our secular societies might not devolve or evolve, depending on how you look at it, into um, theocracies, um, I think is is misguided. I think it could history could well repeat itself. And in fact, it's the living reality for many people on Earth living under um, the proscriptions and prohibitions of theocracies. And again, I just want to mention, you know, without wanting to be overly woke or liberal in my perspective. Uh, I'm not really saying anything per, at the moment around the pros and cons of that in the long run of the survivability of our, our civilization and our societies on this planet. Because perhaps it was an easy question 100 years ago when we thought we were living on an infinite resource that we could expand infinitely and exploit natural resources infinitely. But now there are constraints there perhaps always were, but now there really are real constraints. And so I think this question of what are the bound, what is the boundary between the individual and the collective? So I'll leave it with this, two things. The boundary between the individual and the collective is uh, it going to become increasingly more pressing, and that's going to push people into um, political perspectives uh, and opinions, and religious perspectives and opinions, I think are all going to come up to the fore as that uh, this uh, planet-sized pressure cooker starts to heat up. Um, the other one, I think, is another ideological, maybe metaphysical, maybe just psychological notion around one's relationship with certainty or uncertainty. I think we do have a natural um, aversion of the unknown and Perhaps there's three ways you could go with that. There's probably more. One is um, embrace the unknown, um, but be wary that you don't fall into the abyss, as Nietzsche pointed out, <laughs> or completely reject the unknown and just replace it with certainty and embrace that certainty, the certainty of, um, of the truth of God, according to this tradition or that tradition, or the certainty of the uh, of the worldview of this religion or that religion extremely appealing it does seem to be um uh, a time-tested approach to dealing with uncertainty and then there's this kind of middle ground it could either be absolute indifference or relative indifference and you're just not really worrying about it and you're just getting on relating and hopefully flourishing uh but perhaps for those who have more of a uh, um, philosophical mind might get caught up in some level of anxiety and uh, confusion around how to relate with uncertainty, how to relate with the unknown, and or how to relate with certainty indeed. You know, perhaps those um, true seekers who want to believe in God but haven't quite found it within themselves to do so, um, or and vice versa, want to break out of some religious uh, some certainty tradition, if I could put it that way. That's perhaps unfair, but let's just set aside the religion and just talk about the psychological phenomenon of the relationship with the unknown and the desire for certainty. Um, I think that might really be at the heart of things, and I think it touches right down into uh, the, the, the instinctive and the primal aspects of our nature, and it's always going to resurface itself, and it's always going to lend... Uh, that in itself is going to lend itself to uh, the ideological capture, um, usually. Uh, how to avoid ideological capture, regardless of what that ideology is, I think might be something worth pooling our kids with. So there's 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 a lot there, and I think that 
you know, I would I would like to use some of these things as a vehicle to reconnect back to the wisdom that perhaps we could source from your story. Mm -hmm. So the direction I'm going to try to take to this is one sort of an open sort of admission because I don't think for me, I don't think we can really escape ideology. I think that the desire to escape ideology is itself an ideology. You know, it's kind of like, you know, the, the idea that trying to escape desire is itself a desire, you know, like to affirm ideology and to affirm desire and to work with it as best as we can, so to speak. Now, because of my upbringing, perhaps, because of my scientific sensibilities, perhaps, and perhaps also for pragmatic, politico, global reasons, I think it's important that we, tr at least at this stage of society, try to preserve the secular space as primary in terms of the split between state and religion, state and church, which you, you already mentioned goes both ways. <clears throat> and and try to find out what would be a genuine space of interfaith dialogues between denominations, which is certainly not going to just be sort of peaceful, happy, clappy, everyone getting together and sort of finding out the connections and building a puzzle that builds into a larger sort of global religion. I don't think it'll go like that at all. I don't think it could go like that. And maybe that would be a nightmare. Maybe that would be undesirable in any case. At the same time, that doesn't really get at the fundamental thing I think you're pointing towards, which is this emerging boundary issue between the individual and the collective becoming increasingly more pressing as a result of global constraints and confronting global limits, which has a real to it, which interfaith dialogue perhaps could be a source of inspiration and perhaps could be a source of um, wisdom on its own terms, but at the same time, not clear how the connection is between that interfaith dialogue and practical political state coordination issues when it comes to the global whole. Now, I think that when we look to something like COVID-19 as a global issue, we see sort of the different state reactions to COVID-19 as bringing up and manifesting very real way this tension between the individual and the community because you know the west had a different different western countries had different responses to the boundary between the individual and the community whether we're talking about sweden whether we're talking about united states whether we're talking about other other countries versus china which has a, a totally different model of handling that that process in regards to a violation of the relationship between the individual and the community, which maybe people in Sweden would be shocked by and, and appalled by and, and, and not accept in any way whatsoever. And at the same time, I think case examples like COVID-19, we should use them as, as the general phenomenon being, let's say, how does the human body respond to global political negativities in the 21st century, because that's basically what's what I think is the most general phenomenon for the 21st century. The most general phenomenon for the 21st century is not any positive motivation for a global community, but rather a global community that emerges in response to objective global negativities, where we can't but respond as a community, where we can't but coordinate you know it won't come again not from a positive motivation but from a negative and this is where i like the, now this is where i think this month at philosophy portal we're doing a session called um the session of the month is motivated by the the concept of communism now of course communism is a secular political ideology which has i think the same risks and temptations that the religious denominational issues confront which can be an external cognition that we just force on people in a modern and secular sense. And that experiment in the 20th century obviously failed. 
a philosopher like Slavoj Žižek proposed the idea of disaster communism, the idea that communism shouldn't be motivated by a positive ethos, but rather just an objective response to these global negativities. Now I would go back to preserving the secular space for religions to interact so that we could have that conversation about what would a real global coordination look like? What would a real globe, which would take in consideration sec religious differences, but at the same time, in some sense, subordinate the religious differences because it's secular in the sense that the real incompatibility with the secular and the religious is the religious point of view, which doesn't have any tolerance or capacity to deal with real difference of opinion and viewpoint. Now, where I want to connect this back to your story and source the wisdom of your story is that I know that you went down the scientific pathway and you described that very well from the very beginning. But then when it came to your actual community life, you found yourself in a very weird situation. And I would love to hear you describe the relationship between being a certain new atheist materialist, sort of secularist physicist evolutionist, and then going into community where you have to interact with many, many different viewpoints, many, many, many different strange beliefs. And what sort of conflicts emerge there and, and, and what sort of tensions are present there and how did that also feed back and, and, and affect your worldview? One, how did your worldview affect them? And how did their worldview affect you? And how did that all sort of, how, the, how did that evolve? And, and maybe that will give us some wisdom and insight into this larger issue of the secular and the denominational sort of thing. Yes. <laughs> well, it's hard to know where to begin with that. And I certainly don't think it's ended. So... Um, somewhere in the middle amongst all of that but uh, you know I suppose on one aspect you you enter into a community of people uh, you get to know those people and um, understand you're gonna get your computer called um, and, and you get to know those people and you have to relate with them and uh, or you want to relate with them and you know in so doing I mean I suppose very naively I thought when I was a kid that I'd grow up into a world that was way more scientifically literate, if I could put it that way, uh, than it turned out to be. And certainly when I came to the community that I live in, I was struck by uh, what I perceived at the time to be a, a relative lack of, 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 of scientific literacy, um, uh, perhaps just even more confronted not so much in terms of an evaluation of what people do or don't know, which it sort of ostensibly looked like. It was more like really learning to recognize it <laughs> as, as, as naive and ignorant as this sounds, um, to recognize that other people don't have the same worldview that I do. <laughs> it's like sh shock. Um, it, it wasn't even so much that as, as, as what worldview they do have, which was so seemingly different. Again, um separating out here to the degree as a sort of um preamble of you know the the the, the world view of, of of facts about the way the world is versus let's say the world view of values that people might have and of course there there's a a great overlap i'm living in a in a a community which is very diverse um uh, uh people from all sorts of cultures a lot of australians new zealanders israelis uh, and British and Irish, um, and a smattering of Asians from, because uh, we, you know, essentially an Asian country in Australia, but in my community, at least in this area, you know, it's sort of made up of quite a diverse mix of people. And even if they are Australian, they tend not to be from this area of Australia. You know, when you bump into someone who grew up in this area, it's like, oh, you grew up in this area. That's unusual. <laughs> uh, so it's a bit of a melting point culturally. Um, and then also my community, uh, largely a sort of alternative new age community, uh, which on the one hand, looking at it through a lens of, um, you know, my 
worldview of, or you know understanding of of, of scientific themes uh, scientific knowledge um for example uh, there was a time when the 5g tower was being uh, upgraded in this area or the, the, the cellular cell tower was being upgraded and it was uh, protested and um, at one point someone took it upon themselves to set the tower on fire to prevent any kind of telecommunications mobile communications in the area for quite a few weeks until it was repaired um, uh, uh, all based on what you know at the I can come into some of the aspects around that and where I think the, the, the differences were but coming back to my personal story when I came into the community, I felt somewhat like the proverbial anthropologist on Mars. You know, I'm sort of in a different environment. It's radically different that um, I'm trying to make sense of the vast array of different ways of seeing the world and relating with people, with relating with each other, uh, seeing the way that people's, um, uh, you know, a lot of a lot of kind of pick and mix. You might even say the religion that's not a religion. People have picked and mixed from many different religious traditions and perhaps even seen that as a much more um, wiser, at least uh, open-minded or even enlightened approach rather than my perceived narrow scientific materialist uh, understanding of the world. And um, um, at the time I might have thought they were a bit bonkers in terms of their worldview, but these days are kind of uh, come to realize that I was probably more the bonkers one than they were uh, when looked at through different lenses. Uh, you know, how well do they get along with and relate with their beloveds and their community? That might be one measure of human success and human understanding. We stop talking about human knowledge and start talking about human understanding, which seems to involve a bit of wisdom and, you know, certain values and may, maybe ways of looking at things that uh, really nothing to do with what might or might not have been empirically established and so i had a bit of a learning curve on my hands to um see beyond how how much more there is than what can be shoehorned into the scientific worldview box and for so many years i struggled with that because i thought other people were shoehorning too much into their worldview box and came to realize that you know there's a whole realm of relating and expressing and loving that goes beyond boxes <laughs> we could put it that way and um so therein began my own uh, spiritual not began but an extension of my own spiritual journey in fact one thing i came to realize uh, fairly early on listening to people who ostensibly were on a spiritual path or believed in more spiritual and esoteric knowledge and uh, and ways who perhaps didn't necessarily seem that spiritual in terms of their uh, moral character, should we put it that way. Um, at the same time, someone who was ostensibly atheist and materialist, I came to realize that I was quite a spiritual person in how I um, considered and cared for. I mean, uh, you know, I'm sort of equating morals and spirituality there, but in a way that's sort of what, there's a big overlap. Um, and so then having got to know many, many people who held very different worldviews to me, who became my own, became my mentors and guides in other aspects of human life. Uh, people who I still look up to today and treasure and cherish uh, that have taught me so much who come from a religious tradition. So there's a large Israeli condition, uh, community of people here. Uh, and so then let me move on to a few other things that I participated in. Well, one even within my Israeli friends is lots of um, aspects of the Judaic tradition that they are not necessarily overtly religious, but perhaps they do or don't have a faith, but still value the... The, 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 the precepts and the traditions of Judaism in terms of um, uh, their kids doing bar mitzvah or um, uh, the Shabbat on a Friday night where we get together for dinner and we break bread and maybe it's a traditional loaf that one of them has made and we share the glass of wine 
uh, and uh, you know we say Shabbat Shalom and they say a prayer over the meal and it's for me again someone who had moved around so much in my childhood because of the military background someone who left Northern Ireland at 11 left England at 25 and came to this alternative community then that I've lived in for over 20 years and, and came to, 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 to deeply appreciate the value of ceremony, of, of ritual. And that was one example of it. Um, another is um, participating in what's colloquially known as the medicine community. Um, it's a community of people all over the world who participate in um psychedelic medicines like peyote ceremonies or ayahuasca ceremonies and there's many different variations and versions of that uh, obviously the ayahuasca tradition <clears throat> originates in south america but there's uh, when you actually look at the ingredients of the brew um the com particular combination of ingredients is actually found in other plants in other cultures in other parts of the world so there's some ayahuasca analogs in other parts of the world and there's traditions and sacraments and spirituality and worldview and um and and ritual in many different cultures that uh um are practiced today and have been practiced for hundreds if not thousands of years in various areas that has taken on a certain western form in certain parts of the world as we all know around this the growth of uh, people seeking to have those kind of experiences and it's a very vibrant and active community in my area that I um, <clears throat> began to participate in back in around 2012 and uh, you know the experience itself is one thing which can certainly uh, depending on where you're at with yourself with your worldview with your uh, uh, mindset may or may not th not throw the cat amongst the pigeons on a purely personal experiential level or it might um, um, vastly open or alter your own sort of perspective on on, on existence and yourself uh, but then also the, the 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 ceremonial aspect of it the format of it like many you know psychedelic advocates have talked about set you know mindset and setting like who you're with what's the what's the environment like you feel safe and you know so there's so much there around the power of ritual the power of ceremony the power of some sort of internal compass internal alignment internal direction a set of intentions that you might bring to that ceremony whatever it is that's happening within it um, there's another tradition that I'll mention that I've participated in as well. It's another one of the ayahuasca traditions. It's very well established. It was it was uh, uh, created in Brazil, the Santo Daime tradition, uh, which was created by which Master. I have, which I have personal connection to, by the way, as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and friends here also that were sort of heads of the well, I say heads, but you know, running the sort of Santa Daime tradition here in this area until there was quite a large influx of Brazilians uh, who have you know beautiful people that I've I've, I've participated in that with um, who uh, have taken that over and running a sort of Santa Daime church in that area, and that has a much more specific kind of religious or at least um, formal ceremonial activity while on the brew while on the medicine and and a set of uh um, ideas around what you're doing there so it's a very formal ceremony that won't go into you know so much but it's quite powerful and potent and there's tens of millions of practitioners all over the world many of whom are in brazil and other south american countries and you know it's sort of ostensibly christian but it blends in some African religious traditions and it blends in the sort of South American uh, indigenous jungle or indigenous Peruvian and uh, mm -hmm. other traditions uh, from the from the sacred medicine. But this notion of the sacred, this notion of of, of um, spiritual alignment, this notion of um, showing up uh, to in the highest that you can find within yourself, of finding the courage to um, um, show up in all the ways within your life and to do it within a, commu a community that is, you know, in some sense, uh, 
religious in the in the in the broadest sense um the notion of religion being something that binds us together that uh, brings us together um is something that i feel like i've had a great opportunity and continue to have an opportunity to participate in and um uh, and within that you know many i'll pass it back to you but many deep dives in conversation around the differences between you know how do we reconcile the sort of nominally scientific worldview with spiritual worldviews or spiritual traditions and i suppose for me maybe we can explore this but where i'm at right now is just a recognition that and it, it, it parallels the conversations in some ways that jordan peterson and uh sam harris are having uh i think i met perhaps a little further down the road than sam harris in one respect which is to recognize that it, if there's a difference <laughs> for me it's really just a difference that makes no difference you know whether you want to call um, an alignment towards you know the evolutionary outcomes on this planet whether they're cultural biological and what ends up happening in terms of the evolution and the adaptation of species to survive and thrive uh, in a scientific sense, or whether you want to um, embrace a relationship with God and attach your spirituality and your spiritual striving to, um, you know, to, to some conception of God or beyond even the conception, but some reality that your reality is a relationship with God, that relationship with existence however you construe it ultimately i think um those two things can come into great alignments even even among people who uh, have walked very different worldview paths and i know that from my own personal journey and personal experience i'm still someone who um kind of you know as a, more of a matter of preference, prefer not to use the word God, uh, but that's more just a personal preference because, um, you know, it may or may not be um, misleading. You know, well, which one are you referring to? Uh, a thousand other reasons, maybe none of which are any good, um, but just even just my own historical self kind of really not needing to uh, to use that word to refer to such an entity just really to leave that open but that's my own sort of predilection towards um uh, a relationship with the unknown that's um you know perhaps also ideological um in some sense but i like that i can just leave it open-ended uh, and still find and, and strive to find my own highest alignment within myself with others um and that, of course, is always a work in progress. Fantastic. So there's a lot there to work with. Um, and so uh, I'm glad we took this route back into your story, because I, I think if we stay there, we're really in we're really in 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 a scientific laboratory. And uh, what I mean by that is, a, you know, a scientific laboratory of spirit, because you you know, you you really live this out, and I I really want to emphasize that that you know you, there's no replacement for actually living something out, um, and really sourcing the wisdom from that living something out. I think, I actually, I think you know, like some people ask, like, where does wisdom come from, or where do you go for 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 wisdom? And I, and I think the answer to that is is living. I mean, wisdom comes from living something out. I think is one of the things that that stuck with me from the science of logic was that when Hegel was articulating the difference between universality and singular universality, that he was emphasizing that this logic of singularity is something that can only be really understood. Um, as a consequence of uh, living life uh, to a certain to, to a certain age point, that my point is that that someone at the age of fifteen or twenty is not going to be able to understand the logic of singular universality in the same way as someone who's forty or forty five. That there's something that just comes from a consequence of life experience um, that you 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 can't understand any other way. 
But where I want to start with with what you were just talking about there is the way in which I really do think new atheism um, fell into the Nietzschean trap of becoming what it was fighting. You know what I mean? Like like you know like Nietzsche says, uh, you know, be careful, be careful looking into the abyss that it doesn't look back at you. Mm -hmm. um, you know, that new atheism became a mirror of fundamentalism. Mm -hmm. It became a mirror of what it was fighting. And th the way that came out to me in your story is that, so you have this materialist atheist worldview, but then when you come into contact with this alternative community, which, which does seem to be kind of like a religion without a religion, like where people are, you know, picking and choosing, you know, their spiritual path, that you know, in some sense, when you're talking about there were people with other worldviews that actually had a higher capacity to relate with others or a higher capacity to be beloved in community, that a lot of this has to do with the capacity to misunderstand and be misunderstood. You know what I mean? Like, like how high is your capacity to misunderstand? And how, how high is your capacity to be misunderstood? Mm -hmm. yes. And I think this is the ground, the ground of misunderstanding where actually the fundamentalist falls. Mm -hmm. Because the fundamentalist has to be understood and there has to be a mirror relationship with the other where we have the same worldview. That when you really get into community and you're dealing with difference of worldview, the capacity to be misunderstood and the capacity to misunderstand is the real hack. It's the real, um, it's the real lever upon which we can focus on the actual problem of relation and the actual problem of what it means to be in a community. And this actually, it does bring me back in a way to what my, my issue with is kind of with the, let's say the denominational hack. So like in the same way that the new atheism can be a sort of fundamentalist religion. If you just go into a denominational religion and say, I'm Presbyterian, I'm a certain Catholic uh, denomination or w whatever, Islam. It's a hack. I think it's a, a illusory hack in a bad sense, a illusory hack in the sense of not being connected to the, let's say, imaginary real in the sense of that you can get a type of artificial beloved in community. You get an artificial relating with others. You get an artificial relating to others because, well, this, this community just thinks the exact same way as I think. This community has exactly the same understanding as I have now. Mm -hmm. So we all share, so we all put on the same hat. We all put on the same understanding hat. But we don't really confront the problem of misunderstanding and being misunderstood, which opens up the condition of possibility to real relation and real community and perhaps real love with each other. Mm -hmm. And that's why I wanted to make that emphasis that in this sort of relationship between, let's say, religion that is not a religion, sort of finding your own path and sourcing from the archetypes and the narratives versus plugging into a denominational religion is that you miss this process of misunderstanding. And that's also why I was trying to emphasize that you start with the individual, which I think is why the secularity is important. You start with the individual and then you try to see if it can work for the, let's say the intimate couple and then say maybe like the extended family, and then maybe say the community, and then maybe say the mediation of cults or the mediation of communities. Mm -hmm. And that mediation of cult angle, that's a messy one. I think that's gonna come up. And then maybe the larger, then then you go to the larger whole. But I think that the, 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 the trap that people go into sometimes is that they, they confront a really deep individual negativity. And then they just want to plug into a denominational religion. Mm -hmm. 
And I think that is you're you're basically jumping way too far, right? Because you haven't worked through all of the negativities that you need to actually understand how to relate. To actually understand, and I think that's also why, like you know, psychoanalysis is important, and and maybe philosophy is an is an important companion and and along this path because, you know, it, it's it's really one philosophy should be teaching you how to think, like not thinking this way, but what is thinking. And 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 then psychoanalysis being sort of like your relations are all being mediated by unconscious thinking. And how do we work through all of that? And that's why the misunderstanding and being misunderstood is important. Now, in regards to signification, in regards to do we say the word God or do we not say the word God? Do we, you know, there are some people probably a lot in your community, I've seen a lot in the new age, you know, call it universe or call it being or call it higher power or, you know, different words we could say, which are basically trying to signify God, you know, like in, in the Judeo spirit. or spirit, mm -hmm. uh, absolute spirit, right? And, and or, you Prince. know, and, and, you know, in the in the in the Judeo Christian tradition, every you know, God, you have Yahweh, you have uh, Allah, mm -hmm. and 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 different denominations have different points of view. Should God be represented in an image? Should we say the word? Should it be blanked out? You know, all of this is fascinating, different territory. But you know, what I you know for for me for me in particular, I'm 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 kind of I'm I'm kind of with you that I'm I'm at this point I'm I'm hesitant to signify in some sense I strategically call myself in some sense it's it's merely a political strategy to call myself an atheist in some sense because I don't mean it like I don't mean atheist as in like I think I know 100% God doesn't exist Right. I'm more using atheist as a vehicle through which I could potentially respect different religious traditions and mediate and source between them, as opposed to closing them off as ridiculous. But I want to go back to what you think about what I was trying to articulate about fundamentalism going into this community seeing different worldviews and different spiritual processes as opening you up to different dimensions of yourself and the value of going through processes of being misunderstood and misunderstanding and what have you learned from that and and where are you with that process because I'd imagine it's well I I would say that's a lifelong process I think it's, you know, it really all comes down to human relation, human relationships, yeah. human yeah. relating. Everyone has their own bag of tools. I mean, I'm nearly, I'm, I'm 50 in a few months. And, you know, a lot of my friends are, you know, my age, give or take 10 years, let's say. Um, I have friends who are younger and older than that. Um, so you sort of, figured a few things out of the way you've you've taken a few blows in life you've had a few triumphs in life you've come to sort of understand things perhaps much more than when when i was half this age um and so much just comes down to you know well, what i want to say is each of us has our own um toolbox our own toolbox of tools whether they're metaphysical tools whether they're emotional tools um we kind of pick up a lot of things along the way and we learn from each other. And the more that you spend time with your friends and your beloveds and you go through your life experiences, you start to accumulate not just good tools, but good friends. And um, it, that almost becomes more important than any uh, ideological orientation um, or direction 
um i think that's really where i find myself more often than not i don't don't want to uh, i don't see that as a as a say let's say a collapse into pragmatism i think that's very sort of um cerebral perspective on the situation uh because you know the when i think about on the, on the biggest picture about whether you know we we see that civilizations have risen and fallen over all of human history and it's a great book by jared diamond by the way called collapse which charts a, a consistent pattern of uh where civilizations enter into a pro uh, an inexorable process of collapse uh, and various stages that they go through and uh, uh definitely a, a worthy read for all humans on the planet to see if we can avoid a similar fate for our civilization but nonetheless the question i've always thought is are humans inherently more destructive or constructive let's say integrative um it seems to me that the only reason that we get to have these civilizations that last like the egyptians for thousands of years um and ours broadly speaking since the ancient greeks uh, and certainly our global civilization is made up out of cultures that have persisted over vast tracts of time more or less um is because I think it 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 it's some lowest level, some most basic level, we're inherently more relational than we are opposition. And I don't think that has anything really to do with what our ideologies are and what our worldviews are. I think it's something much more innate, um, something much more in innate innate to the human being, to the human animal. And um some might, you know, say in the human spirit. Um, I see it more in a much more concrete, real terms than, say, even the notion of spirit. But I think that's the reason I mention that is because um, the idea that I have accumulated a lot of tools over my lifetime and 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 have come to have a lot of connections that benefit me when I can lean on them for advice or counsel uh, uh, that I've also accumulated over my my years here uh, um, and that's to suggest that that might be more valuable than some ideological orientation is not necessarily a collapse into pragmatism but perhaps a reliance on something that is inherently more triumphant in the long run than a mediation of of differences I and mean, it is a it is a mediation of differences in a way because it's the interpersonal and it's the relational um but i think it really all comes down to that um more than some other orientation some other particular orientation and that that's going to vary i think depending on where you, know, you, you mentioned before about how do we develop a system or work towards a set of tools and precepts that might help us to mediate across differences, political difference, religious difference, uh, to recognize political commonality, religious commonality, uh, or non-religious commonality. You mentioned also about identifying at least perhaps for political purposes as a as an atheist. Um, let me say something about that because you know there's obviously atheism or let's say theism. Uh, and deism, deism being maybe there's the belief in a in a, a supernatural, or let's just say a, a, a an omnipotent agent. Maybe there's more than one uh, deism, uh, and then theism, which is well, there's that, but there's also a set of rules, prescriptions, uh, ways of being that uh, are also given by that omnipotent agent as a instructions for living a life. Uh, but you might also be a, a, a theist in terms of uh, embracing a set of ideas about a way to live your life while not being a deist. If you're like an atheist theist, well, it's it's an a-deist theist, if you see what I mean. And in many ways, that's what a lot of, you know, people who talk about being culturally Jewish. I love the traditions. I love the cultural uh, wisdoms that have been accumulated over the millennia 
uh, but I don't actually believe in a in a creator, God. Um, so a non-deist or a deist theist. So you know you can mix it all up in here in all sorts of ways. And at the end of the day, what does it even really matter that you identify with one of these or the other? For me personally, it's sort of become largely a moot point. Um, uh, it's much more about an inner orientation. And if if people find that through a sense of shared values, shared traditions, um, beliefs. Well, can, then... I, mm -hmm. can I interject here? Mm -hmm. So man to man, Cadell to Peter, I totally agree in regards to it's a moot point, right? I think where it becomes a non-moot point is on the political level where you're dealing with someone who doesn't think like that. Mm -hmm. When you're dealing with someone who's saying, no, this is the true identity. This is the way, this is the true religion. And you, with your, with your moot point non-identity, are a problem mm -hmm. because I can't relate to you unless you also fill in the blank, uh, believe in Allah, uh, are within this denominational, uh, are within this denominational structure and are recognizing and are submitting to this structure. Right. So, so, I mean, it, it, it so let me let me let me let me back. That's funny. I, I don't think that's really many people, and you know, it, it it's only you talk about it being a political issue, but it's only it's not really a political issue in a secular society. Uh, people can have that opinion. I would like to think that I and I know I can to with many people of of uh, that I know who are, uh, you know wedded to a particular um, ideological framework or religious framework uh, that I can relate with them. It's, you know, it's, it's sort of incumbent upon me to reach across that divide, if you like, and not just sit within my own camp. If there's going to be or whatever that is, uh, you know, to actually reach out uh, to, to, to make it okay, if, 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 if not to reach out. Um, when I come into contact with with people like that and friends like that, um, if they're going to hold on to some, you know, it's a problem for me that you are the way you are. I think that's a relatively small number of people in in secular Western societies, and they usually want to stick out even amongst their own community. I think that's the key point, though. It's relatively small problem in Western secular society. Mm -hmm. So it's it's presupposing so you're presupposing that background, which I mm -hmm. think we've achieved. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Like 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 uh, what here here's what here's the issue that I I really think we're coming to. Uh, what I see as as this is is that this background of living in modern secular society is itself going to become under threat. That's what I'm and saying. And if that background, so like, like so again, what I'm saying is. I agree with everything you're saying, but it requires that we preserve the modern secular background. If we can preserve the modern secular background, then what you're saying holds. If we can't preserve the modern secular background, then we're in trouble because then we lose that. And I think that what, and I think that even goes deeper to the point of why what you're saying is so important is because I think what you're saying and what you're developing and how you're thinking, which is again, sourced from your real life experience, coming into a community with radically different points of view and sourcing from those differences, that that's precisely the skill set that we're going to need to preserve the modern secular society. So I, I wanna bring it back around and just like mega emphasize, I totally agree with you that this at the end of the day comes down to our capacity for human relating. 
and then double down and say, actually, in the pre-modern worldview, where you have specific, and I, I've been reading a lot, like, so I've been reading a lot of books lately about um, the religious wars in Europe, in, in back in the medieval pre-modern world. Mm -hmm. People are burning each other left, right, and center. People are burning each other nonstop, you know, like, little differences, these little, very small differences, and you get burned. Mm -hmm. because of small theological discrepancies right mm -hmm. and this is ripping through the whole continent for centuries mm -hmm. you know so, and and so what i'm saying is is that opening up the modern secular worldview which is basically individual rights and individual opinion and individual belief is important is that actually opens up and now we've opened up into individualism where we get isolated that's a threat of this. At the same time, it's the precondition for actual human relating, and that's the challenge. It's the precondition for actual human, which is at the end of the day what it's about. Because it's not about, at the end of the day, I think it's not actually about the theological differences. No. It's about how hard is it to relate to other human beings, actually. Mm -hmm. Very hard. <laughs> and and so those skill sets become and the skill sets you're calling toolboxes um can become both openings and obstacles right because the toolbox could help you do help help you open up a certain form of relating and at the same time the toolbox could close down another sort of relation or it could become an obstacle to another form of relating so it's like all sorts of interesting things come up here. So I want to I want to source a little bit from from science of logic because what I put us at the center a few years ago, actually, while I was doing the trilogues, uh, sex, masculinity, and God, with Kevin Oros and, and Daniel Dick, we did a trilogue about sex, masculinity, and God. What I put at the center was the non-relation as the precondition for relation. So again, that like would put like misunderstanding as more important than understanding. Mm -hmm. And like working through that, like, like working through, so like basically saying, working through the absolute negativity to use Hegel's idea, and actually then seeing the positive contradiction that comes out of the absolute negativity. Mm -hmm. Like the positive, like seeing contradiction as positive in relation. But I want, want to get at sort of this key idea i think in hegel's essence that i think applies to secular society so we have secular society you say you could have a multiplicity of differences or a multiplicity of opinions and beliefs then those differences which are sort of an indifferent multiplicity can become oppositional and then you have this external opposition with an enemy but I like the point, and this is what I'm going to come back to your point, is that you were saying, I think we're more relational than oppositional. But what is the condition upon which we become more relational than oppositional? Mm -hmm. And I think this is, so then we go from, so you go from indifferent differences, multiplicity of differences, to an external opposition, to positive self-contradiction. That the only way to go from oppositional to relational is positive self contradiction, and I think that po and on the and I think we should have this on the level of the intimate relation with me and my partner, or on the level of me and my closest family members. Can you go from external opposition to positive self contradiction? And that to me is is the pain point. So mm -hmm. I would love to go into you know what you think of what what I've been saying here, and are there any particular pain points? that you've encountered and sourced from your life in community going from external opposition to positive self-contradiction? How, how have you worked through this? Right. Well, I, I suppose just to answer that last point, there's probably quite a few ways. And one of them is just simply to recognize this, that, that just to suffer <laughs> is to, uh, is to see that uh, there's a certain, um pain that you have to go through to um see that there's a there's an opportunity cost uh that you're missing an opportunity by 
hanging on to some perspective or some point of view or some value that's actually costing you in terms of of uh, relational opportunities and uh, and something has to give um and that might that's always going to come down to every individual's personal calibration some people would be like yeah it's the way i see things take it or leave it if you don't like it you can clear off and you know you 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 my the value of your uh, of, of having a relationship with you isn't as 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 high as the value i have in uh, holding on to this belief or perspective and so i think just a general attitude to not being wedded to one's beliefs and i don't mean that in the sort of metaphysical sense just in the everyday sense uh one's uh, preferred course of action or um uh, a, a, attempt to um persuade or convince other people around your way of seeing things and just to constantly i mean this is really i'm just putting in different words what you were saying before um the the the, the sort of um the positive negativity in the relation um uh to and, and one thing i've done with you know all my life is really to bracket my own uh belief um insight value realization um conclusion all of those things almost immediately come with a question after them it's almost like a, a reflexive action now to put a question mark over every time something strikes me with a certain kind of certainty or a certain kind of uh truth uh lest i be wrong about that or lest uh, that, uh, you know, I'm going to become sort of you know, a certain reification of my own perspective. Um, I'm also really conscious that, um, you know, there's a there's a, um, a warning almost from Hegel in the beginning of, you know, his introduction to the science of logic where, you know, this, uh, the, the people who take themselves to be in pursuit of scientific knowledge or of knowledge in general uh or, or sort of there's this there's this separation that is always there between the between what is between, between knowledge of what is known what is given it by knowledge versus the thing that that's knowledge about and there's a separation there that creates the possibility of us becoming wedded to our knowledge in a way which is divorced from the real um mistaking one for the other and um even in what i was saying before about the bracketing of everything in terms of what i come to believe or realize moment to moment the value i come to have the course of action i come to have there's a double-edged sword there um i don't know if that's really addressing what you were talking about but um a certain kind of i guess uh epistemic humility and cultivating that um in each moment not just in some grand metaphysical level about the nature of reality but in the moment to moment courses of action choices of of um, how to relate with my own emotional uh reality um to be able to um focus on how do i maximize uh the the most sort of successful outcomes from a relational point of view rather than an ideological point of view or even a self-interested point of view at least develop the capacity to see things through a few different lenses there and broaden the set of opportunities that i have within myself to um, choose courses of action that might lead to a, a, a greater benefit or outcome in the future and to try and be as inclusive as possible with that um rather than um overriding uh rather than um acting too fast yeah uh, being considerate um being patient i suppose this comes back to a whole lot of spiritual and religious values at the end of the day 
No, I think you are absolutely uh, responding to the to the basic question I have. To me, the most important that came up there was the difference between being wedded to knowledge um, versus what I would call paradoxically a type of absolute knowing, which, I mean, you could approach that with the the way you described it with the paradox of at the end of every conclusion, there's a question mark. You know, like in the sense of... And now Sorry. And okay, great conclusion. And now what? <laughs> yeah, yeah. And then what? Yeah, and now what? Yeah. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And and so yeah, this is this is I think an important disposition to to cultivate within oneself. Um and also really appreciate what you're saying about um I mean in general we could call that epistem ep epistemic humility. Um and and also appreciating what you're saying about not acting too fast and cultivating patience and specifically a cultivating of patience with the negative affects um with the negative emotions with the pain you know like you started by just saying you know the only way to go from external opposition to positive self contradiction is to suffer um and to be patient with that suffering and to think with and through that suffering um for me, I constantly source from the wisdom that can be derived from the conflicts in the in, in the most intimate relation, in in the relationship with my partner, and sort of seeing what comes out of that if we are capable or if I'm capable of holding the misunderstanding. Um, usually the love that comes out of that is more profound. And actually it becomes a deep, rich source of a strength of the bond. Uh, in the long run, as opposed to if you if you prevent that misunderstanding from emerging or if you prevent that disagreement from holding space for that, um, that usually I think what happens is that the relationship can become kind of dead because you're like you're still together, but you're not relating because they're, the condition for relation isn't there. Um, from my experience, it's it's holding the deepest pain being able to, to hold the deepest pain is is the condition for possible relation and again that's why sort of at least for me i, I come back to the to the non-relation as the condition for relation okay so that's it that's think, it that's it in the limit that's it in the in the in, in the limit i think it doesn't always have to be like that uh but the greater the capacity to do that in the limit if required for sure but uh you know that as a practice that as a technique that as a uh, an understanding or a reference point is is great uh hopefully in practice it doesn't come to uh, holding the deepest and the greatest suffering um and within that there's you know as you say this sort of oppositional antithesis to that is one of compassion one of self-love one of love of the other one of uh allowing um whether it's through acceptance or uh just an inner orientation it's like all of these things can kind of come in to sort of mediate the the, the holding of the suffering and the limit <laughs> Well, and yeah, no, absolutely. I, I think holding, like to me, when I'm talking about holding that, holding that space and, and holding the opening of that, of that pain, I think that the, the primary disposition that's helpful in those situations is compassion and love of the other. And so ultimately so those are, you know, th those are, those are, those are, you know, part of the toolbox or part, part of the, part of the things that we need to bring in. It, it can't just be this, this bare negativity. I mean, the the bare negativity won't hold together. the The bare negativity wouldn't hold. The bare negativity is is where you get divorce. Um, the bare negativity is where you get. Um, I never want to talk to you again. I never want to see you again, and that you never meet again, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and you never talk again. Mm -hmm. The only way to hold the bare negativity would be the compassion and the love of the other. But it takes a certain type of subject to be able to 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 be compassionate. I mean, that's that's the like that's the Buddha path, right? Like the Buddha path of like when I say like 
whenever I talk to people who have, have walked the Buddha path um, and, and where they sort of source um, wisdom, it, 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 it seems to come down to compassion at the end of the day. But, but being the type of being that can be fully compassionate to, to not like, to, to me, it's, it's again, making this mistake of, can you, can you hold it in the intimate relationship of the most intimate relationship versus this abstract idea of just being compassionate for all of humankind? Because I don't think like, at least from my experience, so like, I'll just, you know, it could be like, I'll just be explicit, like, this could be a limitation of of just myself and my disposition, my position as a subject versus what's possible in the grand scheme of spiritual development, you know, is that I'm not capable of holding the deepest suffering of, of many people in full compassion. I'm not. I'm not. So, so I'm not, I'm, you know, I'm not, but, but I guess if I were, then I would just, you know, that would be what a, a spiritual that 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 would be my definition of a spiritual enlightened master or something like that like a a spiritual enlightened master is someone who's you know like the ocean for all the suffering of individuals you know like just come into my come into my infinite compassion you know like that that i you know that these are the types of narratives and these are the types of um you know these are at least the words that i hear coming out of the mouth of the enlightened masters <laughs> Or those who, and then there's always that issue of performance versus speech, or action versus speech, and so forth. So coming coming down, winding down a little bit at least, where we've been. Um. Maybe a, maybe a question before that even, is where do you find yourself now in this community? Um, how actual is the community? How um, how do you perceive the differences in the community? How do you perceive the oppositions in the community? And do you see the condition of possibility for real relation in the way we're talking about it? That's a really a really good question. Um, in in some ways, there's, there's two answers to that. One is, you know, my journey over the last year after leaving a, a long-term relationship over 10 years, um, uh, I've found myself um, re-gathering uh, together myself, um, landing, grounding, um, and, uh, you know, largely um, uh, being somewhat of a hermit over the last year compared to the, the vibrancy of my social life uh in the decade before that um but it's a relatively small community i live in um it's certainly one that i think is thriving in many respects i think the uh it's one that's attractive to people from outside that community is you know a lot of people who live there have connections throughout australia and the rest of the world so there's always a sort of constant influx of 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 people coming here and bringing uh certain um I think cosmopolitanism is the right word, but, you know, diversity. Um, and when it comes to a certain level of political awareness or political activism, that's also quite thriving within this community. And in terms of, you know, the the the, the spiritual practice of religionists who are not religionists <laughs> uh, community, I think it's also, you know, thriving um taking slightly different forms i think there's a lot to be said here in terms of people's um uh, awareness of social issues awareness of the value of community awareness of the value of personal um uh, development or, or or deepening or connection uh is all very much alive and well in this community um and uh, you know i feel that that's something that i've not i'm not really aware of uh in any other community that i've lived in and i can't really generalize about how common or not that is elsewhere in the world but it certainly seems to be lacking uh from what i receive from the world and how things appear to be from my home country i have friends and people there um 
and what I see in the news about what goes on. But I think very often, again, it comes back to this aspect that we're more relational than oppositional. I have I have a great faith in um, things being in, t in terms of human relations that there's thriving communities everywhere that most people, I don't know if this is true, but um, I think there's a lot more people living in a, uh, in a in a cohesive, functional community, if not also thriving, than than we might think, given the state of what is reported in the world locally and nationally and globally. I think can I that, ask? Can I ask how intergenerational it is? Extremely, extremely. Okay. Uh, 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 the age difference in terms of what people bring to the table or who is relating with who whom um is is is, is uh, extraordinary from from you know teens to in the 80s you know people i might sit even in a an ayahuasca ceremony with who could be in their mid to late teens or in their 70s not so much in the 80s but certainly occasionally and anything in between and those people are having shared experiences and they are relating about it afterwards um in a sort of process of integration and um, even if it's within the sort of you know, the weekend or the workshop that might last a few days and probably also know of each other uh, because you know that person's that one's grandmother and they're this they're the daughter of or son of you know their neighbors and so on and so forth so there's a great deal of um uh, community activity and integration and cohesiveness uh even when you know even like any community there's going to be challenges and um frayed aspects and tensions and uh, interpersonal dynamics and all the rest of it that goes on as well but um and so for me personally um, having taken somewhat of a hiatus on a few levels from um, friendships and some friendships and from um, certain community activities and uh, that kind of thing I feel that I'm coming personally more full circle after my own journey to uh, re-engage and re-participate and I um, feel very um, lucky and fortunate that um, that community is always available to dive into in a thousand different ways with different people. Fantastic. I mean, this has been a this has been a, a great window into sort of a, a richer perspective on on you, Peter. Um, where do you think we've where do you think we've come in this conversation? Did it give you a different angle on yourself, or did it give you a different perspective on yourself? And and maybe also sort of. Um, a perspective that helps in that process of re-engagement and re-participation? I think um, I, I just feel very um, uh, grateful to that yourself and Daniel Garner have reached out to me to engage and to follow up because, you know, I did the course with you last year. And I mean, one of the reasons I haven't participated in follow-up events like the uh, Lacan's Accretes that you did, Accrete, um, that I would love to have done. But one of the main reasons I'm not doing it is because you're on the Central European time zone. And that usually is either uh, 3 a.m. in the morning start for me or a 5 a.m. in the morning start, depending on the summer times and the daylight savings. So it's really rather challenging for me to participate in the Philosophy Portal events, um, which I would dearly love to do so. And it is a community that I have um, thoroughly enjoyed engaging with and relish and look forward to doing more of it. So I'm actually just very grateful to, to you and Daniel that I've had the opportunity to participate in this kind of format and to the degree that that's a sort of outreach in my direction um, uh, has been very warmly received. So uh, to the degree that this is a, um, an, a, a sharing of um, of uh, uh, like-minded people, um, of uh, new friendships. Um, uh, that's just so incredibly valuable. And uh, I look forward to doing more of that. 
And yeah, it's not been so much we're having, say, either a battle of ideas or an ex or, or an exchange purely of ideas, and to have, it, to have been a sort of more personal um, communication has been uh, very relaxing in a way. Um, mm -hmm. I, by no means as conversant as yourself or Daniel in a vast number of uh, philosophers and um, philosophies as as you guys. Um, so. Often I feel a little out of my depth, especially in the continental tradition, um, as it's probably good that I haven't waxed on lyrical about uh, those things. Um, many other things, perhaps, but uh, I suppose in that regard, I'm glad it's been a more personal conversation than, than a purely philosophical. I do think the personal does lead to an immediate feeling of relaxation. I've had that sort of said to me from a, a number of different angles that you know, when you when you bring it to the level of the personal, it's like, ah, I can just sort of sink into myself and I can just sort of relate from that perspective mm -hmm. um, as opposed to perhaps trying to um, plug in, as it were, to a certain knowledge game, which is operating independent of me, mm -hmm. if we could say it like that. So I, I do think the personal angle to things is important and 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 in any case it doesn't matter sort of what tradition or philosophical thinker that we sort of get initiated into in order to get to that place i think you said it best that at the end of the day it is going to come back down to just basic human relating and sort of getting more relaxed and and, and falling deeper into uh those relational spaces and also creating spaces where relations can happen um and that is sort of one of the, the the points of of sort of the portal, which has opened up now, which is just trying to create those event spaces where different types of relations can can happen and and flourish, um, and at the same time, real learning can occur, and 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 real relationships with elders can occur, um, and and uh, there is still certain, uh, let's say, a, a wisdom tradition which is being uh, cultivated and transmitted. Um, between different age groups and I am aware of the problem of of the Australian time zone I'm not sure if it's going to be resolved but next month I'm moving all portal events to 8 30 central European time which I think is 6 30 a.m Australian time and I'm not sure if oh, that, oh, 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 oh. that uh, but it is it is sort of a push in that direction in that sense because there are some people in Australia including you know some of the friends at Voicecraft. Mm -hmm. which Tim Adlin's leading, which I imagine you'd be perfect for, um, that I, I would love to have deeper synergies with and deeper connections with because the uh, the Australian uh, the Australian mind needs to needs to get uh, more synced up with the European mind and the North American mind in order for these communities to uh, really go to the next level globally speaking. But um, I'll, I'll I'll leave you I'll leave you with the last word uh, in regards to your spiritual story. Um, and 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 sort of where you are now. Is there anything you would want to leave the viewers with, or any ideas you would want to uh, leave anyone listening to us with right now? <laughs> um, I know that's might maybe just a, a think, pressure to say something super deep. Is like, <laughs> I think it's just uh, you know. Always try and just come back to a state of of, of a, a relaxation within the nervous system. You know, it's like anything in life that if you're kind of tensed up or um, struggling or anxious or um, uh, carrying too much on your shoulders, it's like the more you can just kind of, you know, be relaxed, find your uh, find your equilibrium and your sort of groundedness within yourself. Everything else is going to be easier to. Uh, to, to face to do to, to relate to and just just one other thing um i found the whole conversation that we covered there were so many things that kind of popped up in the in the in the wings to dive into and uh i loved that you uh talking about how do we find this sort of um interpersonal interfaith relational uh um uh, set of uh, precepts and tools to help us all um, uh, relate better with one another, find our way in the world, find our way through the challenges. And uh, and we touched on such things as relationship with certainty and uncertainty, I suppose. 
and cultivating a a a a, a comfortability with the uncomfortableness of the unknown of the unknown about whether my bank account is going to be okay next week or the next month or the unknown about whether I'm um, going to run into you know some some problem that I'm facing is going to blow up down the track it's like finding the kind of uh, ability to um, accept what you don't know in a really as, as deeply as possible and to be okay with it and to stay open and to stay ex sort of loose and to stay expanded um that is uh certainly a great challenge uh for me but it's a practice so i'm just going to keep practicing that beautiful it's it was an absolute pleasure as i sort of said before to have you in the signs of logic course and uh it's been great uh, catching up with you in this conversation. So um, yeah, that's been sort of the second Singularities podcast. Thank you for everyone who's listened with us throughout the entire uh, throughout the entire podcast. And uh, wherever you are, uh, have a great evening. For courses exploring the foundation of modern philosophy, as well as live events bringing philosophy to life, visit philosophyportal.online and become a member today. Throughout 2024, our members get access to four monthly events. In March, we focus on the concept of the sacred and welcome guests Andrew Davis, Ruth E. Kastner, and Matthew Segal. Find out more at philosophyportal.online.